Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done 620 something of them now. And uh, if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, uh, B A T G A P, and look under the past interviews menu, um, where you'll find them, the old ones, arranged in several different ways. Um, this program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the website, and there's also a <clears throat> donation page that explains some alternatives to PayPal. Speaking of previous interviews, my guest today is Phil Goldberg, um, whom I interviewed 11 years ago, nearly. 11 years ago, it'll be in January. Um, and uh, Phil and I have known each other for over 50 years, as and last in the last interview I said 40 years. Now it's 50, um, <laughs> and uh, you know we've we've been good friends for all this time and had had some interesting adventures together. <clears throat> Let me, and incidentally, you might like to to listen to the, the first interview we did together. Uh, although I, I apologize for the imbalance of the audio tracks. In in those days, I didn't have two channel audio as I do now, and so my voice is about twice as loud as Phil's. I know that because I listened to it this week, but otherwise it was good content. So welcome, Phil. Good to have you. Thanks, Rick. Great to be with you again. And let me just read Phil's bio a little bit. So Phil has been studying the world's spiritual tradition. Oh, into that. I got to show you guys something. So I mentioned that Phil and I knew each other 50 years ago. Here's a picture of us 50 years ago, roughly. I don't think you can see it, but um, but the audience can. Oh. And uh, that's obviously Phil on the left. The, you, you had a funny story about this photo, Phil. I think your nephew or somebody saw it. And, he, and he tell us that story. I was giving a TM lecture in the, sometime in the 70s. And um, then so whoever took it sent it to me uh, several years ago. And I showed it to my nephew, who was then nine. And he said, who is that? And I said, it's, it's me. It's Uncle Phil. And he said, that's you? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> and and I've get, I crack people up by telling them that story ever since. And my nephew, of course, doesn't remember it. But um, it, it, it just says so much. Yeah, I, I told Irene that story, and she cracked up. She thought that was great. <laughs> ah, the ravages of time. But to tell you the truth, uh, in many respects, I don't know about you, I feel younger now than I did then. Wasn't there a Dylan song? Uh, I was so much... I was um, so much older than I'm younger than that now. Yes, I I know exactly what you mean, except when, you know, I, some of the arthritis in my hip reminds me that uh, I, I am, in fact, older. But yeah, I do feel uh, more youthful in many ways. And... I, I'm, I know more, I'm wiser, but and one of the ways I'm wiser is I don't think I know everything like I did back then. I sometimes think, okay, I, w I really wish I could redo high school in my current state of, of mind. <laughs> you know, I would yeah, have gotten so yeah. much more out of it <laughs> in college. Yeah. Incidentally, Definitely. speaking of hips, I have a friend who had both hips replaced and he regularly hikes the Grand Canyon and things like that. So go ahead and do that if you need to. So here's your bio. Um, Phil is, has been studying the world's spiritual traditions for more than 50 years as a practitioner, teacher, and author. He trained as a transcendental meditation teacher with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in 1970, as did I. We were on the same course, and later became an ordinate, ordained interfaith minister and spiritual counselor. As a public speaker and workshop leader, he has lectured and taught at major venues throughout the U.S. and India. As a professional writer, his articles and blogs have appeared in numerous print and online publications, and he has, co he has authored or co-authored more than 25 books, including an upcoming novel and such celebrated nonfiction as The Intuitive Edge, Understanding Intuition and Applying It in Everyday Life, Road Signs on the Spiritual Path, Living at the Heart of Paradox, the award-winning American Veda from Emerson and the Beatles to Yoga and Meditation, How, Spiritual, How Indian Spirituality Changed the West, which he and I talked about a lot in the previous interview, 
and his relatively new book, um, which I just uh, listened to, The Life of Yogananda, the story of the yogi who became the first modern guru, <clears throat> and his latest book, The Timely Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times, Powerful Tools to Cultivate Calm, Clarity, and Courage. He has produced e-courses for spirituality and practice and has taught many online courses, most recently The Yoga of Intuition and Creativity, Four Pathways to the Divine, How Hindu Dharma Transformed the West, and the forthcoming An Immersive Exploration of the Iconic Autobiography of a Yogi. His special 12-part series, Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times, for Unity Online Radio, features interviews with well-known spiritual teachers. He is currently working on two nonfiction books and a sequel to his novel. In addition, he blogs regularly on Elephant Journal and Spirituality and Health, co-hosts the popular Spirit Matters podcast with our mutual friend Dennis Ramundi, and <clears throat> it has a YouTube channel also, and leads American Veda tours to India. He serves on the board of the Association for Spiritual Integrity. Um, I'm an advisor to that organization and helped found it. And his website is philipgoldberg.com. So I don't usually read fairly long autobi uh, you know, biographical sketches like that, but that was good. It packs in a lot, and probably you wouldn't remember to mention all that stuff if I just asked you to wing it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Let's just kind of, speaking of winging it, I have some notes here, but I think we're just going to have a fairly extemporaneous conversation and cover all kinds of stuff. And as I often say to my guests, um, <clears throat> just don't hesitate to say whatever comes to mind. Um, don't wait for me to ask a question about it, because I might not think to. If you feel like launching into some segue, or, or just go ahead and do it. All right. Sounds like good jazz. <laughs> yeah, right. That's what it is. Um, so I just listened to your book, and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I, I have, of course, have read Autobiography of a Yogi, which probably most of the people listening to this have. And if they haven't, I, re I highly recommend it. They really should. It's quite a book. <clears throat> and uh, it, got, it got a lot of us started on the spiritual path. <clears throat> I should note, by the way, that uh, it's the 75th anniversary of the publication of Autobiography of a Yogi, and there's a lot going on uh, to celebrate that. And I know that people ask you, well, why write a biography of Yogananda when he already wrote this great autobiography? But having now read both, there's a lot of stuff in your, autobiog in your biography that wasn't in his autobiography. and wouldn't have been. I mean, he just wouldn't have gone into all that stuff. But it really shows his human right. side, I think, to a great degree. And, you know, his perhaps vulnerabilities, if we want to call them that, the trials and tribulations that he underwent, you know, as he pursued his mission, <clears throat> largely in the West. And, uh, you know, some of the stuff he had to deal with and I don't know. It just gave gives you a better feeling of the man. And in fact, I mean, the autobiography itself. I I don't know what percentage of it was actually about him. A lot of it was just about all these yogis and saints <laughs> and and people that he had encountered right. or even just heard about. The the autobiography of Yogi, you know, is is probably the most influential book on spirituality, at least, well, in the last seventy five years, at least. Um, when I was researching American Veda. And I asked people what got them on their spiritual path. If they mentioned a book, it was far and away the most often mentioned book. The second most mentioned book, I should say, was uh, Ram Dass's Be Here Now. But when I interviewed Ram Dass, he mentioned Autobiography of a Yogi. So, so it, it, it's, it, you know, is a hugely influential book. Um, and when I wrote American Veda, I had a chapter to devote to Yogananda because he was so uh, influential um, in, the, in the saga of Eastern teachings, of uh, the, the teachings of yoga and, and Vedanta and the whole sort of Indian uh, uh, legacy, that I gave him a full chapter. And while researching it, I, I realized 
he had a really interesting human story. And, I, and, uh, and we know a lot more about his human story than we usually do uh, uh, from renunciate gurus who, who don't talk that much about their past. Um, and I felt, oh, I wish I had more space. And then after the book was published, um, and I was thinking what, what to do next, um, I thought, what about a full-on biography of Yogananda? Uh, and there are other gurus I wrote about that would deserve that. But, you know, I, my first question to myself was, well, but he wrote the autobiography. So what is there? So I, I revisited autobiography of yoga and that's when it really hit me how much he leaves out there are places where he says things like and four years passed and you know he'll just he he talks about his four years in boston which is where he started he came here in 1920 to boston and spent the first four years of his uh what would ultimately be more than 30 years in America, in Boston, and says in four years passed in Boston, and I taught a lot of people, and that was it. And I said, wait a minute, what? What was that? What were those four years like? Here's a guy who grew up in a part of the world where, you know, it seldom got below 60 or 70 degrees. And he was in Boston and he showed up in September. And what was the winter like? What was it like being a long haired, dark skinned man in Boston in 1920 when there was so much racism alive and, and you know, no one, no one had, had very few people anyway had seen uh, an orange clad, uh, you know, Hindu. What was it like? How did he get started? What? So I, I just I set out and I realized there's a lot of gaps to fill. And you're also right that the book is called an autobiography of a yogi and in, it, it is to a large extent, but it's also other things. It's a treatise on Indian philosophy. It's portraits of incredibly interesting people who are not yoga, <laughs> like, you know, saints and yogis and siddhas and people like Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore and uh, Luther Burbank. And, and, you know, so it, it's a lot of things, not just a straight on memoir. And so I felt there was uh, room uh, given uh, his importance and the number of people who admire him and, and revere him, there was room for telling the, the larger human story that's not in autobiography. One thing that struck me as I was reading the book, even though I had already read American Veda and I was somewhat familiar with the history of the Vedanta Society and Vivekananda coming here and everything, one thing that struck me was, you know, what a uh, splash he made in in the West back in the 20s. Um, you know, 6,000 yeah. people would, would turn out for a lecture. And, uh, you know, it was, you know, really kind of big news sometimes when, when he would travel around. Because somehow I just have this bias that, you know, well, Eastern spirituality didn't really take off until the late 60s and early 70s, because that was what it took off for us. Because yeah. we lived that. A lot of groundwork was laid by... Vivekananda and his lineage and Yogananda and his work and the autobiography of a yogi. I mean, you're right. It really took off from 67 through the 70s. But, you know, things were different then. Mass media. I mean, Yogananda was at the he was here at the birth of radio. Uh, you know, the immigration laws had changed. Jet planes, you know, were available. Um, and the 60s happened and, and the explosion of, of interest in consciousness expansion and the Beatles happened. The Beatles went to India with Maharshi Mahesh Yogi. And that was huge. But a lot of the people who turned out for Maharishi and for Muktananda and for Satchinananda had read Autobiography of a Yogi. And you know, they didn't all become disciples of Yogananda. They found other teachers, but he, there was groundwork laid. And you're right, in the 20s and 30s, he started filling uh, auditoriums, but didn't start that way. His first, 
you know, public talks uh, after he came here to speak at a, a, a conference and and then waited around to see what would happen. And then he got invited to speak at a church and he, he was given talks to 10, 12 people in people's living rooms. You know, they all start that way. I, I know people who, you know, went to see Amma on her first you know, times in, in, and it was just small rooms of people, but then word grew, support grew, you know, people who uh, were influential came aboard his work, train, you know, sort of clued him in to how Americans think and what, how, how to reach them. And before you knew it, he was, he, he actually in 27, I think it was, filled Carnegie Hall, you know, so. You and I are quite familiar with Marishi and um, both in his public presentation and behind the scenes. And in a way, some ways, Yogananda reminded me of him in terms of his like almost childlike enthusiasm for everything. You know, I mean, he wanted to go sightseeing and yeah. he wanted to try different food. And, you know, he would play pranks on people and, you know, do do odd things, yeah. you know, stick something in somebody's ears. It was in one of your chapters and, uh, yeah. you know, all yeah, kinds yeah. of kind of playful things that yeah that the, that kind of playful innocence which i've you know i've seen in a lot of gurus you know sw people swamis that that sort of innocent joy in the in the little things of life uh you know and both of the you know the people we're talking about are monks they were renunciates but um they they like to laugh and they like to be made to you know uh, have a good time. And, and it's, it, there was a lot of that in Yogananda that I learned about from reading letters and um, uh, memoirs and things of people who knew him. And that's the kind of thing that when you said uh, there would be things in, in my biography that he wouldn't write about. Well, why would he write about practical jokes and um you know uh like he may have mentioned that he liked to cook he liked to cook for people and liked to hold you know have banquets uh, and honor people and and uh all that but he you know he went to western movies you know in the 30s and and 40s um so yeah there there's that part of Thing. He loved to travel. He collected souvenirs. And stuff. He loved the yeah. American you go to landscape. Yellowstone and all kinds of places like that. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing about him, which again is characteristic of several such people that I've known, is his incredible energy. I mean, he only slept a few hours a night, right? And and he would just go and go and yeah. go. Um, and, and I mean that kind of says something about you know, what in at least some type of enlightenment can be. It's, it, it's, it's something above the norm in, in terms of the way a human being can function. And that, that's, some, that's an impression you get when you meet a great soul like that is, whoa, I didn't realize people could be like this. You know, that this, is, this person is yeah. so much different than everybody else I've ever encountered. <laughs> Yeah, and and people who knew him would say that. Um, and but the, the that business of working hard, uh, you know, the gurus we're familiar with, the ones who came here, especially, they're mission driven. They, they came here for a reason, and they if they developed a following, it was because they they felt you know they were bringing something to the West that you know, hadn't been brought before or was supplementing what came before. Maybe it's a different angle on the yogic repertoire. Maybe it's, you know, a different, you know, because what we call Hinduism, you know, this Sanatana Dharma of India, uh, and especially if you include Buddhism and uh, Jainism and Sikhism, and, you know, it's it's vast and so diverse, and they all brought different angles, different um, priorities, different orientations. So, you know, Muktananda brought Kashmir Shaivism, and you know, Kriyananda, I mean, Yogananda brought his Kriya Yoga uh, lineage, and but they're mission-driven, and they work 
really hard. We both know people who could barely fall, you know, stay awake. And Maharishi was going, you know, at two, three in the morning, uh, working them. And apparently Yogananda was was very much like that. So they have a certain energy, but they're also, you know, they 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 have a sense of dharma. That, you know, this was their. That's why they were here. And they were fulfilling a mission that they felt was uh, given to them and that they didn't question. And they worked very hard. Yogananda worked really hard. And when you think about what he was up against, 1920s were very different from the 60s and 70s. The resistance was more, racism was more. And then the depression came and they could barely pay the bills. You know, there was there were challenges. There were people who uh, were uh, trying to bring him down. There were things he had to deal with, and he he dealt with it. Yeah, I mean, some of the things he dealt with, for instance, um, like you just said, there were financial pressures, and um, you know the, the the Great Depression came along, and a lot of people who had been able to support him no longer were able to, and that was a struggle. Uh, and there were all kinds of things he had to do to deal with that. And then he had some fairly some people who were really close to him and uh, kind of his right hand man, so to speak, who ended up leaving him and eventually trying to sue him. Um, you know, so he had some kind of betrayal kind of situations that he had to deal with. And and his, your book portrays his personal reaction to those things, both in terms of his the emotional impact it had on him. And also, you know, the, the strategies he tried to employ to to deal with these folks, you know, um, obviously fighting fire with fire and having to rec- resort to legal recourse of various kinds. Yeah. And on top of the actual lawsuits, and there are two important ones, uh, as you said, for people who had been close to him, um, they made front page stories in the Los Angeles newspaper. So all this happened after he set up his headquarters in L.A. And so he had to deal with the um, the the media backlash and the public uh, perception of things, as well as the actual uh, lawsuits and hiring of lawyers and the sense of betrayal and all the rest of it. Um, and and one of the interesting things about that that comes out that you know another thing that wouldn't be in his own memoir um, there were times and this is on record it's in letters and everything where he just felt you know I don't need this <laughs> I just I I want to go back to India I want to do what I originally set out to do, which was to be a a sannyasi, to be a monk. And and the one time he did go to India, he was in India for a year, the only period that he was not here from 1920 till his passing in 1952. And he, you know, he he visited monks and and he just, he said, I want to, pardon me, wants to stay here. And just like, walk along the Ganges and be with God. And that's what I, that's why I renounced, you know, the householder life. That's why I became a a monk. I did not, he called organizations hornet's nests. You know, he, he, he didn't want to be involved with all that not craziness, but he knew it was necessary. And it was the mission was the most important thing. And I, there were a few times where he said, I may not come back. You know, I may, I may go back to India and, and stay there. Uh, but he didn't. And, and he actually, it reminded me of that scene in Godfather 3, where Al Pacino says, every time I think I'm out, they pull me back in. He, he, he said on, a, on one of those occasions, he, just, he went to Mexico to be by himself for a while. And he said, you know, Yogananda did, not Al Pacino, just, right? Yoga, right, Yogananda did. And he said, I, you know, I, 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 I asked Mother Divine, I asked the Divine Mother, please let me just go back to India and be a, a you know, a humble monk. And she said, no, <laughs> you got to go back, you got, you got work to do. And so he did. 
And, and, you know, and you have to admire that because and, and, and it's one of the many ways where if you look into the lives of somebody like that, um, you, you, you find inspiration for your own path and you find uh, kind of a role model situation because you think, um, I think my life is hard. You know, so did his life was hard and he was a monk. You know, he didn't sign up for this, but he did what was he did what had to be done. And he did it in that spirit of establishing yoga, perform action that from, you know, as best as he could to maintain his inner state of uh, peace and and bliss and to be joyful and to treat people well and to behave honorably and with dignity. At the same time, he had to work really hard and and he was up against uh, very big challenges. So you think, okay, every time I think I want to just get out of here and renounce the world and go live in an ashram, I think, well, you know, the, I'd, I'd probably go there and, and get bored and get annoyed at the monk in the next room. And uh, <laughs> When we look at the story, at uh, the stories of you know several, quite a few, in Eastern teachers who came to the West, um, it seems that th the impact of Western culture um, got to them somewhat. In other words, compromised their integrity or their integrity. They it was compromised. They allowed it to be compromised or whatever. Um, they weren't able to maintain quite the impeccable image that they tried to portray. Um, did, do you feel like anything like that happened with Yogananda or did he really kind of maintain a, a very high standard? Well, most of what you're talking about, which is why you started the Association of Sp Spiritual Integrity and why I'm involved too. So, you know, there was so much disillusionment about some of the gurus in the 60s and 70s and later, you know, and especially some of the self-anointed uh, spiritual teachers. So we're very aware that this happened. When I was looking into Yogananda's life, I, I, came, uh, it, I came to realize there are people to this day, this is 80 to 90 years later, arguing over whether he had affairs with some of the women in the ashram that uh, became the, the international headquarters of his uh, self-realization fellowship. This is three, four ge generations later, and people, they're still arguing about this and looking for evidence. But there weren't any that. women who said that, that, that it happened, were there? That, that, that's a difference between no. him and some other gurus. There was one woman who, in a letter, said he tried to kiss her or hold her or something. But there's reasons to doubt the veracity of it. And if, even if it does, she didn't say they had sex. She didn't say, you know, he forced himself on her or anything like that. It was all very 1920s. So people were interpreting, you know, what might have happened when they saw people go into his room late at night. That's right. They saw people go, women going into his room late at night. And then, and, and, you know, as we said earlier, some of these yogis, they, they work till three, four in the morning and then sleep for a few hours. So he had people coming in, they were working. That's, that's the story. And you think, well, if he was going to be doing that, if he was going to have affairs, he certainly wouldn't do it by you know, parading women in his, his room in this place where everybody would see them. It would be more more clandestine. And there were accusations of that. There's people who claim he fathered children and they can show you, look how much this one looks like this person and all that. And I went into the project thinking, okay, maybe he did. Maybe he did have some fall from grace. Maybe he did, uh, as other gurus have. It wouldn't detract from my respect for the work he did, but I, you know, I'm writing a biography. I'm, I, I have to be objective. I'm going to look into the evidence. And, you know, people were hoping 
I would be the one who <laughs> who blew the whistle on you know Rogananda. And of course, on the other side are people for whom such a thing would be totally unthinkable because he was a, he's a sainted figure, this impeccable human being. How could it possibly happen? And I was you know saying, well, let's see where the evidence leads. And I didn't find anything really convincing, just sort of speculative and inf inferred. And and there were some DNA tests, which didn't pan out. There were DNA tests about the, the uh, one of the alleged uh, children. Um, and then there are people to this day who say that SRF tampered with the DNA samples and it was not real, you know. And so there are people who, to, you know, will who were disappointed that I didn't uh, find, you know, that I didn't declare the, you know, the truth of Yogananda's transgressions. And there were other people who thought I shouldn't have even mentioned it because it's so unthinkable. You know? <laughs> and the, that's the extremes on this thing. And I found the same thing when writing American Veda and looking into the uh, scandals of the 60s and 70s, there would be those extremes as well, even in the light of very convincing evidence, there would be people who said, no, 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 it can't be. He would, my guru would never do that, you know, so they're human. And one of the things I liked about working on Yogananda's story was telling the human story. He was worried about money. He got angry that when, you know, people disappointed him and all that. And, you know, I thought, this is great. I can see it in the letters that were made available to me. He was uh, he was annoyed at some people. He was upset about this and that, um, and worried about money and the future of his organization and the uh, you know whether it would endure all that throughout his his time. And you think, oh, he's an enlightened yogi. He wouldn't worry you know, what me worry, right? Uh, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be concerned about that, you know, the God will support him and he would have had faith. And he had a certain equanimity, it would seem, and a certain grace, but he did worry and he did get angry and he, there was a human part of him. I loved that. And he was also very kind and very loving. The, the other human qualities come out. He was very close to his family. A lot of renunciates, you know, certain orders, they, you know, they don't, they dis disassociate from family life. No, he was in touch with his father. It was so sweet to read about his reunion with his family when he went back to India and all that. Um, so he, he had a sentimental side, <laughs> you know, uh, the, hum the human part of the uh, equation is, you know, to me, terribly important for us to emphasize. So, you know, people love to put gurus up on a pedestal and then they love to tear them down. And in the meantime, they're still human beings. I thought you approached it in a very fair way. And um, you, we were, you were just trying to get at the truth as best you could. You, you didn't have a, a bone to pick one way or the other. No. And I was fully prepared to say, hey, look, you know, I really admire Yogananda and, you know, I, I his impact and his influence is, is so incredibly important. But look what I found. It looks like, you know, he had he did have a fall from grace, but I didn't. Nothing was convincing enough. One interesting aspect of his personality that I found that that your book highlighted was his indomitable will it's like there was this story about when he was a child and he he fancied some orange candies that were in a shop and, and tell that little story <laughs> well you it's fresher in your mind because you okay. just heard it yeah but um, I read basically it, but he just he, really was fixated on these orange candies he really wanted them and he was like you know not taking no for an answer and making a big fuss and finally his mother had to go late at night and wake up the shopkeeper because i guess the family couldn't sleep until yogananda got these candies <laughs> and uh and that's interesting because i'm i'm always a little bit fascinated both philosophically and in my own experience with the uh, balance between asserting one's will versus not insisting that things happen in any particular way so as to be more in tune with the will of God. 
And if you reach a certain level of consciousness, presumably, then your will is the will of God, and and you're 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 a, a vehicle for it. Uh, and, and maybe would, if God really wants orange candies, then you're going to scream until you get them. <laughs> well, but but here's another thing about it: there are people. First of all, let me say, human will and strength of mind. He taught that a lot. He, he, he spoke about it a lot. You want to accomplish something, willpowers. And he really emphasized that a lot. Um, and he did. He had this indomitable will and, you know, it showed up. And there's many other examples of that. Uh, but the other part of that is when he, a lot of his closest disciples, the people who, you know, are for whom he's master, they call him master. There's people who think, you know, he was born enlightened and is, is maybe an avatar and, and all that. But in my reading, my evidence, you see the evolution of his spiritual life throughout through time. He was writing about breakthroughs of consciousness, and he, he wrote long letters to people that uh, I read that uh, describing, you know, these, these experiences that, you know, people like you and me would probably say, shoot, I wish that would happen to me, you know, breakthroughs. And if you if you look at them over time, they they're indicative of the kind of stages of growth of spirituality or conscious evolution of consciousness that, you know, there are uh, uh, prototypes for, there are models for. And there were, for example, periods of, of going into deep samadhis on, um, spontaneously and then coming out and, and describing them to people and writing in, in letters. And, and there was one moment where he said, from now on, I will always have this inside me and you won't know it. You won't be able to see it. I won't look any different, but he just knew it had that breakthrough into some permanence of, of that, you know, higher consciousness and realization of the self. Well, that to me is is a sign that he he experienced spiritual growth. He wasn't born that way. He was a seeker, and he had uh, his own sadhana and his own pursuit of higher consciousness and moments of realization and and breakthroughs. And you know we don't get to. Uh, uh, see that in the so-called enlightened ones very often, but he left behind a record of that. And, and I, I love, I, I, and there were stuff that, you know, I just couldn't put it all in, in my book about him. I just had to choose some of them uh, carefully uh, and make choices, but it was there. And the, the other piece of that is that indomitable will as a kid, he knew that he was meant for the monastic, life of a, of a seeker and spiritual leader as a kid. I always, I always joke when I've talked about this, it's like when, when we were all teenagers and we all had people that we knew who were called ringleaders and they were, they would like be the ones who threw a party or, you know, did some mischief, you know, let's go shoplift, let's go do this, let's, you know, whatever borrow dad's car, you know. Yogananda was a ringleader, but he was organizing satsangs as a as an adolescent. He would gather his friends and go see, you know, this guru who's in town, the Swami they heard about, or go to the temple because it was a festival of some kind. And he was going to see every guru, every Swami, every person he could meet and talk to. Uh, he was also pretty athletic. He was he was a good athlete. Uh, you know, he he ran races. He was apparently very fast. But his main activity as a teenager was spiritual. And when he was 15, he started an ashram. You know, that's a mark that was there. And he he went off beginning at age like 
12 or 13, three different times, just left home to go off to the Himalayas to find his uh, guru. And the family had to go running after him and bring him, bring him home. You know, he got pretty far uh, from Calcutta to, I, I have the mileage and what it would take. I've, I don't remember the details, but I said, wait a minute. He was like 12, 13 or 14 or whatever. And he went from, he, he, he took a bag of stuff and created some subterfuge and got on a train and went on his way to Rishikesh, but only got as far as Haridwar before they found him and brought him back. And so I, I calculated how long that would take now on a, on a train. And it was a major undertaking to, to do this. And he was a, you know, an adolescent. So, you know, that, the, the, the passion, the pursuit of the divine was just that strong and that obvious even when he was a kid. Who did he think he was in past lives? What was it, Alexander the Great or some such thing? William the Conqueror? I forget. William, William the Conqueror. Yeah, Arjuna. But, you know, well, that one, I'm not, was that him saying it or was it somebody saying it about, yeah. I heard that he said that. I don't know. Maybe somebody said it about it. And, uh, you know, I'm asked about that. I, you know, and I'm agnostic. I don't, I don't know about people's past lives. People have told me who are my past lives, and I, I don't know what to take seriously or what not, not to. But, you know, there, you know, when he's, he told followers he, he had been William the Conqueror, so now those followers wanted to be the people around William the Conqueror. So they you know, made their choices. <laughs> Another thing about him was that, and we're not going to spend this entire interview talking about Yogananda, but so far we are. Um, we don't okay. have to. Well, we can. But um, another thing about him was um, <laughs> he would often have visions of something that was going to happen, and then that very thing would happen. Yeah. And, you know, that's part of the, um, the autobiography of a yogi. People talk about be, uh, the the number of miracles and wonders and uh, super normal psychic uh, uh, experiences that he describes, not just his own, but even more so uh, those of great yogis, and uh, and they're all there. You know the miracles of you know people levitating and people being in two places at the same time uh compared to a lot of the wonder works <laughs> in, in the book his own you know uh premonitions and psychic insights seem almost ordinary compared to some of the other stuff and in my experience there's two kinds of people who read autobiography of a yogi and for whom you know the book had an impact people who are drawn to the miracles and wonders and there's a lot of them um, in the book and think you know that's what opened their eyes this is great they can't get enough and people who don't believe a word of it they they they're skeptical they think he made it up or he's gullible and you know he did these things didn't really happen there's you know but they like other aspects of the book, and and they're so they're fans of it, nevertheless. And he makes a, a an effort in the book, you know, he wrote, came out in 1946, of putting those things in the context of the science that was available at that time. You know, laws of physics as they were known. He has a whole chapter called the Law of Miracles, and so he he, he attempts to. Uh, you could say sensationalize, but make a big deal of them, and at the same time explain them rationally and scientifically with the uh, emphasis on th these are things that are possible if you you know if you're a yogi and you do your your you know you evolve to those states, uh, but like all the other great teachers, he also said, don't get caught too caught up in that stuff. And I tend to think those things are possible myself, but as some skeptical friends of mine have pointed out with, in, with whom I've been having conversations, 
this stuff always happens in the past. <laughs> you know, you never, you never see anybody now, <laughs> even you know, who who can do this stuff. And there, therefore, you really wonder whether it ever happened. Why, why wouldn't it be happening now if it happened then? Well, I I know those arguments, and the counter arguments to that are things like you have no idea how much they're going on just because you haven't experienced them, but there are yogis in the Himalayas and all that that are doing these things all the time. That's one reaction to that, whether it's true or not, I don't know. And um, people will say, but you know, people have psychic experiences all the time. And you know, some people have them more intensely than others. Yeah, psychic. I mean, and there's people like Dean Radin and all who who study this stuff. And But it's this, this sort of, you know, you have to be a a master of statistics to to actually discern the significance of various measurements and all there's nothing obvious going on like walking on water right but i know but people might say oh yes but it happens up in the himalayas and wasn't happening on the streets of calcutta in yogananda's youth but they heard these stories and uh, and he claims to have witnessed some of them well you you know a skeptic would say well, he, you know, he's he's seeing what he wanted to see, or it was a trick. The gurus do, you know, they knew how to make you think they're <laughs> levitating or uh, manifesting things. You know, our our friend Dana Sawyer, um, who has been all over India many times, and he 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 knows all these tricks. Like, and so he he would you know, see these guys on the street making their pulse stop. And he said, oh, you have a walnut under your armpit, you know, or or the milk was dripping down. Oh, yeah, yeah, you did something with a sponge in your hair or whatever. But then he, he said the one thing he ever saw, which he couldn't explain away, was this guy who could swallow a, a live snake and then regurgitate it. He said that that was not some hocus pocus. He said he saw the guy do it. <laughs> I do it every Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, you know, and the other thing they'll say is, well, the atmosphere in the world is so much more corrupted now. And, you know, that when the atmosphere was pure and, you know, in the along the Ganges and, you know, in the Himalayas, then these things were more possible. I don't know. And I don't much care. But well, I'll tell you, there's one one thing that uh, I have to bring up. I always wondered why so many, why did he put so much attention on these in the autobiography? Because he didn't do it to that extent uh, in his teaching life. Um, and I thought, you know, what was the reason for that? Well, it turns out, you know, he was, he wanted to write a book about what he called the Yogi Christs of India. And he was gathering stories and materials for that book and then was persuaded to write this memoir. And so it became a kind of combination of autobiography and that. But at one point, I asked the, my liaison people at SRF when I was researching the book, and I said to you know, one of their leaders who was really you know, master historian of Yogananda, and I said, why all the miracles and wonders? Why did he do it? And he and he said to me, have you looked at the title page of the book? You know, we're here on the inside where what, is, what does it say there? We can't quite see it. OK, but it's on that title. What's called the title page of the book. He has a quote from the New Testament, except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. He said, there it is. He told you the purpose of it right at the beginning. And I never noticed that. And I realized, OK, he was getting your attention so he could talk about things. He did something like this in his public presentations. I and mean, he had he had a guy come out and warm up the crowd by lying on a bed of nails and sticking needles through his tongue yeah. and all kinds of, all kinds of weird I things. Know. And I thought, you know, that's a little too showbiz. That's a little too vaudeville for my taste. But it got people in the door. So, you know, whether that was a compromise, whether that was, you know, P.T. Barnum's kind of stunt, you can that's up to you to to decide. But um, he did make those choices, especially in the 30s when money was tight and, and uh, you know, getting people in the door was not 
necessarily easy. He had those people doing those things. One reason that um, I, you know, find the whole idea of cities tangentially interesting is just that if if people really could perform them demonstrably, you know, verifiably, it would blow some minds in terms of, you know, what the laws of nature are and what our what human beings' relationship to them is. I mean, if 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 someone could levitate, for instance, and it could be totally proven that they were doing that. Um, you know, by any kind of scientific scrutiny anyone wanted to to put on it, um, you know, people would really have to rethink, you know, what is the mind? What is gravity? You know, what is the relation? What is consciousness? What is the relationship between consciousness and laws of nature such as gravity? I mean, it would it would completely upset the apple cart paradigm uh, of current scientific thinking, which I think needs to be done. Yes. Yes, and that's why some people, uh, well-trained psychologists and neuroscientists, have been studying this stuff for a long time. I mean, I know Charles Tart, who was one of the early uh, 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 researchers in psi phenomena, and that was his whole purpose: try to, you know, you. Uh, verify these things, try to show that these things are possible, not for their own sake, but because of what it would open up in terms of our understanding of consciousness and the possibilities of human potential. And people like him have always been uh, uh, troubled by the fact that uh, their research wasn't taken as seriously as as they felt it should have been. But I think that's why Yogananda did it as well. He wasn't there to tell you you could levitate or you could appear in two places at once. He was there to tell you this is what is possible. This is the relationship between consciousness and matter. And this is these are the things that are, you know, the kind of things that are possible as as you evolve in consciousness. But um, yeah, that's interesting. I, you know, and it was yeah. to some degree. Another rather little bizarre chapter in Yogananda's life was um, his praise of Hitler and Mussolini. Um, here's a, I think this yeah. quote is on Hitler. He said, the average man cannot think clearly. He needs the mastermind of a dictator in order to think right and do right. And then on Mussolini, he said, a master brain like that of Mussolini does more good than millions of social organizations of group intelligence. This was like in 1934 when those guys had not yet come into their full. <laughs> yeah. And and maybe maybe even earlier, um, he later uh, changed his tune about those people, obviously. But, you know, when I found those things, I thought, oh, my God, what does that mean? Well, then you do you look into the history and you realize a lot of very responsible grown up people in the period between World War One and World War Two uh, didn't get the rise of fascism when it was happening at the beginning. They saw, you know, Mussolini was stabilizing Italy and unifying it and, uh, you know, helping the recovery after World War One and and the, the early days of of Hitler which seems so unthinkable to us now. But there were some people who just thought, yeah, they need a strong leader. Uh, he was democratically elected, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the country is in bad shape and he'll, you know, that's what, what they need. There, there was a lot more of that than we realize, especially in the late 20s and into the early 30s. But by the time uh, Yogananda on his way to India at that time, went through Europe and spent a little time in Germany and Italy. Uh, he, he was starting to be troubled by what was going on then. And then, of course, you know, became outspoken. And that's one of the things I, I, admire, I came to admire about him. He was a monk. He was a spiritual teacher in a foreign land. He was not able to become an American citizen until toward the very end of his life. Uh, he was a British subject until India independence, and yet he spoke out. He spoke on behalf of Gandhi, and the Brits were spying on him, and uh, you know thought he might he might be de he thought he might get deported, but he spoke out against uh, bigotry and he spoke out against uh, racism and um, 
uh, militarism and all kinds of things. Uh, and I, I, I thought, okay, good. An example of somebody trying to, uh, who's in the world and not of it in, in that usual way. And uh, uh, an argument against uh, spiritual teachers who tell us, you know, all this is Maya and we shouldn't be bothered with, you know, current events and politics and uh, foolish human things like that. No one knew better than Yogananda the the reality of non-dual oneness. No one talked. He talked about Maya all the time and told people not to get too caught up in the world and blah blah blah. And yet he was very aware of world events and spoke out when he needed to. Which um, highlights one of my favorite reflections about enlightenment, which is that it's it's really. Uh, a blossoming of multidimensionalism, we could say, in which, you know, you can simultaneously regard the world as, you know, illusory in a way, and yet take it seriously. And, uh, and you can, you know, you can reside in a state at which you are not doing anything, you, the, the essential you, your true nature, and yet you are dynamically engaged in activity. So it's really kind of a, the growth of the ability to incorporate um, paradoxically opposed dimensions of reality within one e human experience. I couldn't agree more, as you know, and um, I think it's a terrible misunderstanding of concepts like Maya and non-dualism to uh, adopt an attitude of our human a story being meaningless or uh, being indifferent to you know the suffering of human beings embodied human beings and uh to you know turn away from it because you know it's very one of the earliest lessons in reading the bhagavad gita for the first time was krishna telling arjuna you must act there's no such thing as not acting, you know, in the world. You know, you you have to. You're an you're an embodied human being, and action is necessary. Then it's a question of what kind of action and what do you do. And so all the teachers said, "Yeah, this is all a dream." Yogananda used to use the movie screen analogy. You know, we're all, you know, it's just all illusory, you know, light and shadow on, on the movie screen of oneness and formlessness. And we're just, you know, like the characters on the screen. At the same time, you have to act as if it really matters and do what you do well and do it with integrity and do it uh, impeccably. He worked his people around him very hard while telling them not to get too attached to the things of the world. He would make them work very hard to get things done. You know, different spiritual teachers and teachings and movements seem to place different degrees of emphasis on different aspects of spiritual development, as you were kind of alluding to there. I mean, some are just, it's all about consciousness. They don't pay much attention to anything else. Some are like, it's all about behavior, you know, being a good person, and they don't even consider consciousness. Um, so, you know, in terms of that consideration, what, what would you say Yogananda's balance was of the various facets of, of potential development? Um, did he cover all the bases? Did he place a fair amount of emphasis on ethical development, for instance? Um, or what? I think he would have been in line with I, your way of thinking that um, we have to, the priority is consciousness, the priority is your sadhana, you do your, do your practices every day, don't compromise on that, make that your highest priority, associate with uh, you know, a, a, the sangha of fellow seekers don't get too caught up in the world. At the same time, do what must be done. Do your dharma. Do your action with honesty and integrity. 
behave in accordance with ethical principles and good morality. And you do both. And he would not have thought that the uh, expansion of consciousness alone would necessarily automatically lead to right action. It would just make the odds better. But you had to, you know, people who had proper training and proper upbringing, you know, <laughs> knew how to behave. And, and, and he would get upset with people if they, you know, slacked off or they didn't do their jobs well or they got lazy, he didn't like laziness. Um, and I think most of the gurus I've ever met would be in the same boat. Priority is, you know, he would have said your, your relationship to God, your relationship to the true self, this is what matters most. But you're also a human being. And every, I, I, I don't know of any respected guru these days, even now, who doesn't have some kind of serious service project going on that their ashram or their lineage is sponsoring if you know they're in india they're they're you know helping villages get you know toilets and clean water uh they're growing trees they're you know feeding the hungry they're doing that and you know that um that is in every tradition that you know god is first but you also have to serve and you know serve the humanity in a way and and i uh, you know i i've seen that many 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 times i'm sure you have as well and i mean ama ama has programs going on all the time it's not just about hugging it's about it's about service and uh you know and i you know when i take groups to india and we visit gurus and stuff it's it, you know it's it's very impressive how much of their efforts are around service. And I think that there's more to it than just helping the people because it's a spiritual practice for the helpers as well. Yes, um, that's, that's right. It's karma, karma yogi, karma yoga. And that's a big part of it because, you know, some of it is, you know, go clean the toilets in the ashram and chop vegetables in the kitchen. And that's, you know, that's a practice and it's not just that it's you're earning good karma or something it's it's also i think that um it it kind of attenuates the ego um you know it's not all about yeah. me 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 uh there's you know what can i do for this person what can i do so it kind of takes the attention off of the individual needs and preferences and and so on it makes you more yeah. universal it's a in kind a of consciousness that's right. It's a kind of consciousness expansion because we're all, we're selfish human beings. We're always thinking, what do I need? What do I want? And when you're forced or encouraged, at least, to do something for others, it, it's in a way liberating. I was I once heard a guru say, if you want to be depressed, just think about yourself all the time. And when you're when you see people you know, in true need, and you're able to bring something to them, or you just know that you're doing something, even if it's just, well, my guru told me to, uh, you know, I'm going to, you know, do whatever this is, or, you know, whatever the task is, it, it's not selfish. It's a form of expansion, you're bringing something from the inner self outward, and, you know, connecting it, it's, it's, that's why it's considered spiritual practice to, to, to do acts of service. And I think we've all seen examples of people who have left that out of their spiritual practice repertoire and the, the results it has on their personalities. I mean, there's, it's almost a caricature of, you know, the, what was that? Somebody used the term flow bro. Uh, these guys who just sort of live for themselves and, <laughs> bounce from one relationship to the other and couch surf around the world. And, it, and you know, there's just kind of this self-absorbed, I mean, I don't mean to sound holier than thou or that, you know, I'm, I'm free of any such tendencies, but um, <laughs> I mean, chuckled, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I guess the point I'm trying to emphasize is if a person is really sincere about spiritual growth, then this needs to be part of the toolkit. And if a teacher is offering it, great. Yes. If they aren't, 
maybe you need to find a different teacher or kind of freelance in order to engage in something like this. And sometimes it's something very simple. I knew, you know, look, we were all spiritual narcissists at one point in our lives, and, and um, so many of us still are. But I've seen people who were very self-absorbed, and all they wanted was their own enlightenment, and, you know, all this stuff. And then suddenly they were parents. And suddenly they're thrown into, or they're, they're, their parent needs caretaking. And they're suddenly thrown into a situation where you can't be selfish, where love just brings out doing the, the priority becomes the care and, and uh, of, of, a, of another human being that you love. And that's a form of service that comes naturally to people. And often it's a revelation. It's like, oh, that meant so much to my spiritual life. It's a form of bhakti, you know, the, that love and devotion. I'm often asked, or I have been in the past, to, to describe my, you know, most uh, memorable spiritual experience. And I used to talk about, you know, transcending and, you know, on long meditation courses and, you know, this feeling of this and that, because I, I never had spectacular experiences. And then about 20 some yard years ago, I was visiting my father when he was ill, and it was a whole thing, and I had to rush him to the hospital, and I had to clean up the, a mess after him, and it was an all-night thing, and I came home, and I, back to his house from the hospital after being up all night, and just doing and doing and doing for him, and I sat down to meditate, because I wanted to go to back to sleep, and I just felt bliss. And this oneness, and I said, what the hell is that about? You're exhausted. And I realized I hadn't thought about myself in like six or seven hours. It was just pure giving and doing instinctively. And I said, that's when I realized, that's why people do this service. That's why people, you know, go to work for Mother Teresa or, you know, emptying bedpans. There's something powerful about that. It's not my way, I, you know. It's not like I gave up everything and <laughs> and and you know became a hospital orderly, but it was it was really really interesting, and so you know we that's why gurus you know whatever your dharma is, like you are doing a great service with Bat Gap, you know Dennis and I are doing a Spirit Matters podcast, you know. It's just service and our own enrichment. We learn a lot and all that. And so, you know, we do what we can. And some people are just, I, I bow to their, you know, uh, spirit of, of service in the world. And many of them could use a spiritual practice because they're, you know, busy saving the planet and, and social justice and all that. And they don't have that spiritual uh, inclination and there's a lot of burnout and a lot of uh, so some balance there for the individual is terribly important. Well, I think we covered that point, but we can always come back to it. If no, that's a good point. <laughs> I, it's an important point. Um, there's some I gotta, well, anything. Just I was just about to say anything more about Yogananda, but there there were some poignant. Uh, pages towards the very end of your book of your book where he was approaching death and when he actually did did die even the very last day of his life and um, for, for one thing he saw it coming he maybe that was yogic ability or maybe he just felt really lousy and he felt like he wasn't going to live much longer um, but uh, he was telling the people close around him and there was a really sweet scene where he he sat in his chair in his room I guess it was at Mount Washington and um his close disciples are around him and he just looked into each of their eyes one by one. And it was this, this beautiful blessing scene that happened. I don't know if you want to comment on that, but the whole thing about the end of his life. Well, I'll say, yeah, those pages writing about the, the last period of his life. And as you said, he, he knew he, he was not going to live a long life. He knew that a long time. How old was he when he died? 15, uh, 59. Um, and 
and had been not well in many respects, you know, over the last few years. But at one point, he, knowing that, he stopped all his travels and everything and just, you know, just worked really hard, probably too hard, securing his legacy for the future for after he's gone. And big part of that was writing Autobiography of a Yogi, which was going to be the thing that, you know, lasted after his death. At, he said it would, and he was right. Um, and the, you know, the organization and the finances and the training people, he would, that's what he focused on. But to, and the, the most poignant part of writing the book for me was writing about those last days and the last night of his life. And some of it was uncanny. Like he had said early and earlier, when I die, my beloved, you know, India will be on my lips because he, he, he loved his homeland. He was very happy when it achieved independence, always wanted to go back for another visit, but only had that one. And the, the, the night of his death, the occasion was a big banquet for the visit of the first ambassador to the U.S. after India's independence. And Yogananda was a keynote speaker and blah, blah, blah. And he gave the keynote speech and he read a couple of stanzas from his poem, which was a, an ode to India, so to speak, and his beloved homeland. And as soon as he finished, he felt, you know, at the podium and died of a, of a heart attack. It was really pretty uncanny. And that scene that, of course, uh, I learned about because disciples who were present wrote about it. Um, yeah, he knew he, he didn't have long. I don't know if he knew he, this was his last night, but he knew it was one of the last. And and he had the people closest to him. It was very tender, very beautiful thing. Uh, and you never know how much of it is exaggerated by people after his passing. But there were a lot of people at the banquet and they saw that happen. Yeah. Oh, that that part, yeah, but the the other little things, the, the premonitions and the all that, but it, you know, it's it, it, there, there there were people who felt certain about him so strongly that you kind of expected to hear of uh, a resurrection story. Yeah. Well, there was the the body not decomposing story. Yeah. That. But, but that's different. And people have felt him come to him, them in visions and stuff, but nothing, nothing like, you know, be, <laughs> the Christ story. But um, it's very, it's very beautiful. He was beloved by the people around him. And, and it, it shows in what they wrote about him after he was gone and while he was alive. And, you know, like all the other gurus, he had people very close to him who loved him and supported him and wrote checks and, you know, opened doors for him and, and then got close to him and had the, you know, darshan, the special darshan and that made others jealous. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, it's very typical guru story in many ways. And then therefore there's a lot to be learned about the gurus and gurus and disciples, but it's also unique because of his, written his having written autobiography of a yogi not many not many gurus write memoirs like that well i think we all owe him a debt of gratitude you know i mean everything he did like you said in the beginning really paved the way for whatever teacher we may now align ourselves with or have aligned ourselves with i mean he was um a big contributor to what I believe, and I'm sure you do because you wrote American Veda, has been a significant influence on the West. I mean, yeah, uh, one of the big three, if not the, the most important. I hate to rank people, but there were clearly three of the gurus who came here who had the, the biggest impact, the biggest influence. Vivekananda, Yogananda, Maharishi. Uh, in, in sheer impact. Did you know that Vivekananda and Maharishi had the same birthday? Same birthday, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and he, Yogananda's January 5th. So make of that what you will. <laughs> he was born the year Vivekananda came here. <clears throat> okay, so we have about 45 minutes left. So what else do we want to talk about? Um, 
there's your book, uh, Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times, and these are certainly crazy times. Um, there, there's the, so the uh, whole issues that we consider in the Association for Spiritual Integrity. Uh, we, we talked about those quite a bit in, in our first interview, and we've touched upon them here. Um, but help me prioritize. What, what, what should we cover in our remaining time? Well, the most the most important thing, Rick, is for me to plug <laughs> the course I'm going to be teaching starting in January, going through Autobiography of a Yogi in 10 sessions, weekly sessions for Hindu University of America. So if you want to, anybody out there wants a deep dive into the book and supplemented by stories I you know, know from my own research, uh, go to hua.edu and sign and so up. So you'll read a section of the book and then you'll, everybody will discuss it. Yeah. yeah, right. Approximately 50 pages per week and then we'll discuss and talk about the messages and all that. And since this interview will be up for a long time past January, um, I wonder if that'll be online. It'll be archived. It'll be archived. Yes, uh, being taught online, and it'll be archived. Thank you for allowing me that shameless self-promotion. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you have. Um, okay, so um, issues around the dilution of yoga, cultural appropriation, perennial philosophy, whether all roads really do lead to the same mountaintop. Well, that's an interesting topic, whether all roads le really do lead to the same mountaintop. I've had discussions with Dana about this, too. Um, Me, too. I'm a, and we're about to interview him all about that on Spirit Matters. Oh, and Irene just sent me a question. Let's do the question first. This is from... Uh, Let's see, from Dennis Sullivan in Beaverton, Ontario. Oh, maybe it's Denise, but it's spelled, well, that's oh. French speaking people say Denise, Dennis, you know, D E N I S. Anyway, um, he's wondering, or she, I am curious if Yogananda ever spent time with Mother Teresa. I'm also curious what other saints he met. Well, he met a lot of saints, but I don't know if his life and Mother Teresa's overlapped. No. No, no, no. There's a beautiful chapter in the autobiography of about Ananda Ma, and there's footage of them together. There's a beautiful chapter about his time with Ramana Maharshi, about which I was able to find out stuff from the Ramana Maharshi uh, people about that visit. That's not an autobiography. There's a chapter about his visit with Gandhi and his uh, and other saints, and <laughs> but Mother Teresa was not, they did not overlap in India. In fact, it was, he dis, He spent a year in it. What was the year he spent in India? What, 30 something? Uh, mid 35 to mid 36. So Mother Teresa was still a young girl then probably. Yeah, the, the section in the book about um, him meeting Ananda Maya Ma was beautiful. In, in the autobiography for Yogi. And, uh, okay, so that answers that question. So the thing about whether all leads re, re, all roads lead to the same mountaintop, um, let, why don't you sketch it out so I don't talk too much? Well, that's that's essentially, you know, the, the position of uh, classical Vedanta and, and of the perennial philosophy, which, you know, our mutual friend Dane is an expert on and has written a lot about as a scholar. And, you know, people like Houston Smith uh, and uh, Aldous Huxley and, and those people who are very much influenced by Vedanta uh, philosophy uh, are, were perennialists. And there's, there's other well-known scholars. And the, and the essential point is that in the, in the mystical branches of every spiritual tradition, if you look at how the people describe their experiences, there's a remarkable similarity, if not identical, if, if they're not identical. Different languages, different uh, terminology, centuries, even even 
different centuries, different cultures, even different theologies. Uh, Houston Smith had a very important distinction that he, 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 he mentions in his um, introduction to American Veda uh, between the exoteric, exoteric aspect of religion and the esoteric. The exoteric meaning the, uh, the theologies, the belief systems, the doctrines and dogmas, the view of history, the rituals, all the external stuff. That's where you find differences. And that's what you know most people focus on and fight about and argue about and go to war about. The esoteric, the inner experience of religious experience and engagement, this what we think of as spirituality now. Uh, that's where you find unity. That's where you find sameness and oneness. And people have argued with this. But people who are spiritual practitioners, and, and who, who look at people like Ramana Mah- uh, Sri Ramakrishna, who decided to test this out, by doing Christian and Muslim practices to see if it gave him the same experience of oneness that his traditional yogic and you know uh, Hindu practices did, and came out and said, "Yeah, all lo- all roads do lead to the- all paths do. They all give you different views, and they have different terrain. But when you get to the mountaintop, it's the same." He used the analogy of uh, uh, two different analogies. Uh, if you go down, you know, to the ghats along the the river, the, the steps down to the river. Uh, you see people, you know, who speak different languages and they'll have different words for water and they'll have different methods of extracting it. But it's the same water. And you can get to the roof of a building by climbing a rope or taking the stairs or, you know, many different ways. But when you get to the roof, the view is the same. So there's a lot of different metaphors. And in practice, And in my experience, by talking, just the interviews I've done and talking to people, the verification is in how ordinary spiritual practitioners describe their spiritual experiences. And so to me, it's it seems perfectly obvious. But at the same time, the descriptions can be just different, you know, different enough to give you doubt whether they mean the same thing, whether they intend the same thing, but on the level of experience. And here's here's something I learned. I don't know. I didn't make this up. I I was part of a group uh, and we used to do this exercise that somebody had come up with where you where you got together people from different paths and you described your most meaningful spiritual experiences. And the rules were you couldn't use religious jargon. So you couldn't, you you didn't use God. You didn't say Brahman. You didn't say Allah. You didn't say uh, Atman, Samadhi. In none of those terms, you just had to say what you experience in plain language. And then you see people describe the same things. Vastness you know, transcendence, uh, unconditional love, you know, all, all the different qualities, bliss. But um, so this has, you know, been argued, as, especially in academic circles forever. Uh, but it would be a big remedy to, you know, religious discord if we got away from belief systems and dogma and talk more about people's personal experiences. You know, I know a Christian minister when he when we get him to talk about his spiritual experience without invoking Jesus, it's very much like what many of us would have experienced. And we could throw psychedelics in the mix too, the kinds of experiences people have on those. That's right. And in fact, uh, people who do that research have told me it's it kind of bears out the the, the uh, premises of perennialism that the the experiences are in fact uh, virtually identical or very similar.
And I think the reason this is significant, and it's not just some interesting intellectual thing, is that all these traditions are telling people that what they're aiming for is something that is indeed universal and fundamental and essential. It's kind of foundational to the universe and whatever terminology they use, but it's the it's the essential constituent of everything. It's it's the essential constituent of you. It's what you ultimately are, and so on. I mean, and some of them say this in clearer terms than others, but um, that is significant. Significant because it suggests, and the fact that people across all cultures and times have experiences like that is significant because it suggests that consciousness is not merely a product of the brain, which is a predominant scientific understanding or paradigm these days. And uh, consciousness doesn't die when the body dies. And, and you know, we are not isolated to this flesh and blood form, you know, we're, we're more like a field that transmits through or reflects through this form and many points like that. Um, but, you know, that understanding and, and moreover, that experience can be profoundly transformative to a person's life. And I agree. And even if you're not, and I know people like this, who are not willing to make that leap into, you know, uh, tatvam asi, <laughs> well, into, into that thou art, that we are, you know, the, the real self is uh, eternal and infinite and beyond uh, form and so forth. Even if they're not willing to go there, even if they're not willing to go to uh, consciousness uh, exist, uh, you know, outside the, the brain or in the body, they, they definitely have to go to these experiences are transformative and they change your life for the better. And that if you realize you can have these experiences and be a Buddhist and be a Christian and be a Jew and be a Muslim and be a whatever, then there must be some commonality that's more important than the differences. And, and, and if nothing else, it gives, it, it's a blow to exclusivism and triumphalism and that you know my path is the only way for everybody it's a, a more ecumenical vision and if you look at the surveys of americans attitude toward things about religion and spirituality you see more and more people over especially since the 60s moving in that direction of yeah all the paths are useful for different people that's a big deal, and that that means a lot. I've also noticed that um, there are people who hold strongly to dualism. There are branches of Indian philosophy that hold that, you know. That's right, and and they won't go to uh, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, and thou art that. But when you when you ask them you know to, when you probe their inner experience especially if they have a contemplative or meditative practice that's deep and you ask them you know have you ever had experience of being conscious being awake inside without thought just even <laughs> gotta stop talking with my hands just even even for a moment they'll say yes and many of them will, will describe um, what we call pure consciousness, or, you know, Turiya. But they won't use that language. They may never have heard that language. But yes, I've had that experience of just consciousness alone by itself. I was awake. And then thoughts came in. And, and how'd you feel during that time and afterward? Oh, it was perfectly at peace. I felt I was, you know, and if they are religious, they might say, oh, you know, I felt like I was in the embrace of God. And if they're not, they just might say I was never more content in my life or something like that. And so they they can acknowledge that experience of non-separation of, of their inner self with anything. And yet 
you know, they'll still want to maintain the dualism, but the experience is still the same. Now, I take it a step further, and I think you would too, especially since we're both old TM teachers, but, um, you know, it's not just that this experience is gra personally gratifying and enjoyable and perhaps improves your life. You know, you begin to l adopt healthier habits and drop unhealthy ones and you get along better with people and, and all that stuff. But um, this potentially has huge implications for the world. And I think we're all concerned about the world or we should be. And there are so many problems that beset society, you know, I mean, racial and societal unrest and um, very difficult situations that people in various countries are going through. And we have this huge influx of migrants coming up from Central America, and those people are going through such a hard time in Syria, and there's the environmental, you know, situation which potentially could wipe us all out, and the bees are dying, and I mean, we could go on and on for hours enumerating all the, the problems, any one of which might be able to do us in, and, <laughs> um, you know, I I really feel and have all have felt since the f I first heard the concept that consciousness is fundamental and that all problems on the surface of life are expressions of inadequate contact of a tremendous field of potentiality which lies at the depth of life and if the you know if the if the hose could be connected from that reservoir to the various relative fields on the surface, they could all flourish and we would find solutions to these problems. Or maybe some of them would just sort of drop off without even applying a specific solution. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm as optimistic and idealistic as I ever was on that particular theme, which is one of the things that motivates me to do what I do. Yeah, me too. And I I adopted that perspective, you know, back 50 years ago, like you did. And I have seen, I've experienced nothing to change my mind about it with this caveat. It's more nuanced than I originally thought, and I know you agree, that we thought if you raise consciousness and the evidence bears this out. People become, you know, make better decisions. They become more creative. They become a little more compassionate. They become more uh, effective in their lives. You know, the, 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 the evidence of anecdotally and through science is, supports this notion that if you, if you do these uh, spiritual practices that expand consciousness and bring you in contact with the source of consciousness, um, uh, then there are practical results, and and that would lead to uh, better behavior and better solutions in the world. The the thing I've come to modify that with is it's not automatic, and just the the growth of consciousness isn't enough to make people uh, behave in an exemplary way, or not do foolish things. And this was never more clear than, you know, this last several years when, you know, we've beset by all the problems you were that back in the 70s, we would have thought would be long gone by now. And they're not. And you can say, well, that means, you know, not enough people are, are meditating, not enough people are expanding their consciousness. And that's no doubt true. But the other disturbing thing was how many people who do do these practices uh, are either indifferent to the state of the world or are caught up in strange and destructive things like conspiracy theories. And that that came as a shock to me. Um, and I don't quite know. Uh, what the solution to that is. And if you add to that what we talked about before about presumably, you know, enlightened or at least highly evolved spiritual exemplars misbehaving, usually around sex, sometimes around money and power, 
then you realize it's not necessarily a one-to-one correspondence with you know elevated consciousness and ethical and moral behavior um and and so something has to be done on that level which is what motivated you to start association for spiritual integrity and got me hooked on making a contribution to it because it sometimes there's a disconnect between the expansion of consciousness or and the the deep inner experience of a realization and awakening and moral behavior and this you know karma to be considered and upbringing and you know whatever else that's a really good caveat, um, and let's let's th- let's talk about it for a little bit. Um, I, I think about it a lot. I th- you know I live in a community where you know a lot of people, a few thousand, have been meditating, doing spiritual practices for many decades. I know at least half a dozen who went to the January sixth event, and who will tell you that oh it was just like a peaceful tourist visit or something like that, um, and I. I there are spiritual communities around the world, as we saw in our presentation with Jules Evans and Dan Wilson at the in the ASI, where you know vaccination rates are so low that whooping cough and and old diseases like that are are cropping up um, because the people have been convinced that they should take vaccines. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, probably about we we probably just got about a dozen thumbs down on this YouTube video because probably some of the people are watching. <laughs> um, and um, I guess to, to distill this into a essential question, um, I, I keep coming back to, we've got to evolve a form of spirituality, which is um, well-rounded, which, which doesn't have any important missing pieces. And I don't think that most, which is why I asked you that thing about Yogananda earlier. I think m- most spiritual movements you look at have some missing pieces. Something hasn't been emphasized enough. And if you look at some of the traditional texts like Patanjali, I mean, he seemed to cover a lot of the, the pieces, and the yamas and niyamas. And... He wasn't running an organization. <laughs> and if, aside from, I mean, I don't really consider myself part of any organization these days, but... Uh, I think a lot about this well-roundedness aspect of spirituality. I, I sort of feel like you can really handicap yourself by neglecting uh, s- certain aspects of your makeup or of your development um, by ignoring your blind spots. I mean, some people, like for instance, our friend um, Miranda McPherson um, and and others, you know, and um, advocate you know, seeing a therapist every now and then uh, or going to a variety of spiritual teachers just to sort of like, you know, get outside your comfort zone and and broaden your perspective and so on. I don't know if it would be a one size fits all solution. uh, And you can you can elaborate on what I'm trying to say here. But um, somehow or other, I think spirituality may be evolving. Um, Not that there isn't anything new under the sun, but that you know, it's there's something new about spirituality coming into this culture, the 21st century, with everything that's going on and the incredible pace of change and all the challenges we face. It somehow has to rise to meet the challenge, and um, and failure to do this can really throw a person up off the rails. And I've seen so many examples of it where people have just gotten. Um, off into La La Land, uh, uh, you know, gotten into very, you know how cult indoctrination happens kind of incrementally and you don't even realize it's happening until you're deep into it. Well, in a way, even though some of these people I wouldn't say are in a, an official cult, I think a lot of people have just drifted off, who have really de- dedicated their lives to spirituality, have drifted off into some very strange places. And there are numerous articles. I mean, I could send you, I have sent you a, dozens of links. Yeah, and you've written some stuff on it. So I don't know, I, I, you get my point. 
Of course I do. And and there's a lot to be said on, in what you just said. One is that, you know, every spiritual teacher, we've already talked that they're all human. And so their teachings might be missing stuff. You can't, you know, be no, no uh, lineage, no organization could be all things to all people. Uh, and that's true. I mean, I've never, I've researched all the spiritual teachers, uh, organizations that were created by gurus who came here and by uh, inference others. And they're all imperfect. They're all dysfunctional in some way or another. They are, you all have followers who complain about them and who, you know, think they're perfect on the other hand. And, and that makes sense because the, the, the founders were human and the people around them were even more human. And less evolved, as we know, you know, as we've ex we experienced ourselves. And uh, so that's part of the deal. The other is, you know, I always come back to some people having a, 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 fanat a personality that is drawn to fanaticism. If you look at Vivekananda's famous speech in Chicago in 1893, one of the things he talks about is fanaticism, religious fanaticism, and hoping that gatherings like the one he was at, which, you know, people from all the traditions, would be an end to fanaticism and all the damage it's done. Well, here we are 130 years later, practically, and fanaticism of different kinds is still a problem. And you see it in spiritual communities and and some people then get drawn at, in a fanatical way toward things that can be destructive and not based in evidence i think one of the things you were alluding to with you know spirituality for this time and place is that we are evolving in evidence-based spirituality america I, one of the reasons people often ask me when I talk about American Veda and Yogananda and all this, why Americans were so drawn to these teachers from the East, including the Buddhist teachers, you know, all those Zen teachers and uh, all the others. And it was one of my uh, explanations is always Americans, there's a, a, a um, segment of Americans that are very open-minded and curious and that pragmatism runs through the heart of America. We're very pragmatic. If something works, even if it seems strange, hey, it might work, I'll, I'll check it out. That's, and that led to the you know people, all these gurus becoming very popular because they didn't ask you to believe in anything. They asked you to try out these, these methods of meditation and yoga and everything and see if they work for you. They didn't ask you to convert. They didn't ask, you know, tell you to adopt a belief system. It was a pragmatic, evidence-based spirituality. And we're, you know, that is still evolving. You know, you and I remember when there was, you know, a couple of studies on TM. And now, you know, there's thousands of studies on different meditation practices and the utility. And I think that the, the evidence-based quality of it is is an important piece of it and people's i think people need and this should be part of ordinary education um training in how to sort out information and separate speculation and lies from things that can be proven and things for which there are evidence. And we're, we're living in a media landscape now that makes that very difficult. Uh, but at, and then we come back to consciousness and the, the well of the mind that the information is coming into and how it is processed. So I, I, I still, like you, come back to that as fundamental. Yeah. Another thing I come back to these days is that I think that a lot of people, when they get into spirituality, underestimate the amount of transformation that it's going to be necessary to undergo and the the range of possibilities, the, 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 you know, the vastness of the spectrum of, spiritu 
of spiritual development that they're embarking on. I mean, when we first started, we were told that we'd be in con cosmic consciousness in five to eight years. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, what you end up realizing is that it's really a lifelong undertaking and you never rest on your laurels and that um, there's, it, it's, it's, a, it's really a huge thing. And, and you can get tripped up even after decades, they're, they're sort of the razor's edge, you know, there, there can be pitfalls at any stage of the game. And there are actually Vedic stories about this, who great rishis who ended up falling because they got tripped up, they made some mistake. So I think that it's always important. It helps to have that realistic perspective, I think. To me, it's realistic. I agree. And uh, even the people who did slip into, you know, what we used to call cosmic consciousness, they turn out to have more evolution. I remember reading in the local paper, one of them got busted for marijuana possession about, I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago. <laughs> so. Okay, and, and, and they may, you know, they may uh, do unethical business practices or have bad relationships. There's, you know, we're humans and we always have to keep growing regardless of whether we're witnessing it all uh, you know, from this state of uh, pure consciousness, uh, and maybe there's there's always further development as long as we're in these bodies. And one of those areas of development, it so it seems, is uh, ethical yeah. and moral behavior. It's, it's a key one um, because if it's neglected, I mean, if you don't do your pranayama or something, no big deal. But if 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 ethical and moral behavior is is neglected or violated um, ser seriously, it can really um, there's there's a saying punya. It's your spiritual merit that has been accumulated. It can really pop your punya balloon <laughs> and uh, you know cloud the mind and cause you to to start doing even worse things. And the notion that right behavior automatically follows from you know samadhi from from spiritual experience is you know it just doesn't turn out to be true um you know it's just not automatic i think there's some correlation you're more likely to behave in the right way you're more likely to obey you know the sort of rules of the road but if you've never taught those rules or you had contempt for them before, you might still misbehave. You might, um, you know, uh, because that part of your curriculum in this life needs to be addressed. Well, you know how Jesus was tempted by the devil during his 40 days and 40 nights, and uh, he could have succumbed to that temptation, perhaps, um, or how Buddha under the Bodhi tree on the brink of his enlightenment was assailed by Mara and all the demons and temptations and you know that it's like there's almost in a way something that at a, even at a very advanced stage if, if these stories are representative of actual mechanics uh, tries to throw us off the track or you know a, it tries to s test us to see if we're really serious about this uh, so again, uh, there's a quote I've used for many, many times from Padmasambhava. He said, although my awareness is as vast as the sky, my attention to karma is as fine as a grain of barley flour. Uh, you, I've, you've shared that with me in the past, and I, I love it. And, uh, and that's very good advice for all of us. You know, we may be in bliss. We may you know, be you know, feeling spiritually exalted. But then, you know, as the Zen people say, you have to chop wood and carry water. Uh, you know, there's that old saying in Zen, before enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. And, and people don't quite realize that part of that, uh, the meaning of that is you're still chopping wood and carrying water, but your experience of it may be vastly different. But you still have to chop the wood and carry the water. Otherwise, you know, you don't have, you can't build a fire and you can't quench your thirst. And part, but the, you know, the implication of that is 
you should do that with integrity and you should chop wood and carry water with dignity and concern for others and compassion. Look, you know, a big part of the Buddhist teachings is about nirvana, getting enlightened. But what what else? Also compassion. And they have practices for cultivating compassion. And you have people like the Dalai Lama talking about compassion. Both of us interviewed Robert Thurman for our podcast. And I, I was interviewed by him not long ago. And one of the things I admire about him, he's not only a scholar of religion, and he's so close to the Dalai Lama. He's passionate and fiery, you know, about climate change and the importance of it. And I've met other gurus, I've seen them in India working, you know, to combat climate change and make people aware that this is real. Um, so being in those states doesn't mean we're not also human. Another thought that comes to mind is that in the early years of my spiritual path, um, I was just going along being myself, but I did things which by my current standards were completely outrageous, would be egregiously wrong and insensitive and cruel and, um, you know, crazy <laughs> by my current standards. So I think, you know, what happens is, you know, this Pabasambhava quote about the grains of barley flour, um, at first, you know, maybe to, to take your chopped wood thing, you know, we're just swinging a big dole axe and whacking big pieces of wood. But later on, we're kind of becoming this fine sculptor, you know, just carving this intricate thing. Um, your discernment has to become refined. And um, the the sort of the, it's not difficult, but the, the row, the, 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 your walk has to be more and more fine tuned. You know what I'm trying to say? Um, I do, yes. And and maybe part of that is you start uh, chopping wood and carrying water to people who need some help and not just not just for yourself and your household. But um I'm glad you used the word discernment because um that's always been a big part of the yogic path, you know, Shankar, the great, you know, non-dualist wrote, uh, you know, a book that has been translated, Crest Jewel of Discrimination, but now they might say discernment, and Vivaka, discernment, intellect, discernment of the intellect is highly valued, and, and, and often in spiritual circles, oh, we should be in the heart, and you're in your head too much, and you think too much, and there's an almost denigration of the rules of logic and of rationality. Well, the yogis were much more balanced about that. You know, they were, you know, all about the heart and feeling and love and compassion, but they were also about discernment and discrimination and um, thinking clearly and following the rules of rational discourse. If I understand Shankara correctly, um, what he says is that you know the the final stages of enlightenment or the higher the, the higher stages of spiritual development require a really subtle refined intellect but he said that at, at the earlier stages you just don't have that and you can't have that uh, and what you need to do is purify yourself to the point where you can and therefore karma yoga you you should just engage in activity and good works and and things like that and through that you'll eventually become pure enough that a, a more subtle intellect will begin to dawn and it's that subtle intellect that accomplishes the final stages of realization and that and that is using the mind to go beyond the mind so ultimately discernment takes you to the door beyond which there's nothing to discern that's just you know there and but yeah, that's and we haven't even mentioned bhakti, you know, and we mentioned Raja Yoga in the sense of doing meditative practices. But bhakti is also, you know, uh, the, the devotional activities and the, 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 the um, traditions that emphasize bhakti and, you know, all the practices around doing uh, uh, so ceremony and chanting and singing. Yeah, all that can be very purifying. Yes, and it it's a you know you you can transcend doing that. You you know people have great experiences doing that, and it it opens the heart. So you know we we should we all need balance. You, you mentioned Razor's Edge, 
you know, that that comes out of the, that image is from the Upanishads. And um, when I, I remember writing somewhere, you know, that if you're going to be walking on a razor's edge, you need balance. That's I think that's the point of the image. Yeah, you need to because if you go too far in one direction or another, you know, you get in a big trouble. So extremism and fanaticism. He was a big time fanatic before he found it. <laughs> a question came in from a fellow in Portland named Emile Picard, and he said that he actually had a visitation from Yogananda about 10, 10 years ago. He said it was comforting, the visitation. He said Yogananda told him things would be hard, and he's wondering if um, Yogananda ever appeared to you in a dream, uh, and if so, if you feel comfortable sharing about it. I I am not uh, inclined to such experiences, uh, but uh, no, he never has. And, and people have also asked me when I was writing about him, uh, did did I feel his presence? Did, you know, was I being guided by him? And I know people have had these experiences, and I I don't want to appear cynical about them. They, they may very well be real, um, but it didn't happen to me. I did feel at times being guided by something, you know, that, that, the, you know, there was something right about doing this and it was going to be, you know, it was important to do. And, it, you know, all the obstacles sort of seemed to, you know, dissolve as soon as they arose and it, you know, became uh, doors opened and all this. And so I felt in a sense guided and supported by something beyond the ordinary but I can't say it was Yogananda or he came to me in a vision or anything like that. Uh, I feel closer to him, of course, because I just spent all this time researching and writing about him. But but I was never a disciple. Uh, I was never a devotee or even a student uh, other than, you know, drawing a lot from his books like many of us did. This copy of Autobiography of a Yogi I first read in 1970, uh, but I was already on my path. Uh, and there's been a, there are a lot of people like me, millions like you. You know, you got something out of his book. You were inspired by it. You learned from it, but you 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 had a different path. But then there are those who read this book, and their whole lives change, and they become devotees, and they become disciples, and some of them become monks in his tradition, and that's a different level of uh, engagement. Even now, you can still do that, right? Yeah, people are still doing that. Any final thoughts, Phil? No, I thank you for doing this. It's a uh, great joy, always fun to talk to you. And I'm really glad that our lives are intertwined these days with the ASI, that we get to sort of talk to each other often. It, it's it's a lot of fun and it's a meaningful thing. And if anyone wants to check that out, it's called it's spiritual-integrity.org, the, the Association for Spiritual Integrity. And, you know, there are many events we have which you can participate in without being a member. And then there are some other things that are just for members. And members, yeah, I guess you have to be a spiritual teacher or therapist or healer or something along those lines to, to actually be a member. Although I've been arguing for open membership for... Yeah, may, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll change that someday or you know, find something. We're new, but I, I would hope, encourage people to check us out and support it and you know, become a member. There's nothing, uh, no ob obligation or anything. And uh, we hope to be able to make a difference. Okay, so I'll be setting up a page on batgap.com as I always do, and it'll have links to your books and to your website and to the ASI that we've just mentioned. and you know, everything that you gave me in your bio. <clears throat> um, so people can just, if they're watching this on YouTube or something, if you want to get to all those links, go to Phil's page on BatGap, which is actually in the description under the video on YouTube. And then you can jump from there to all the links and things that I just mentioned. So thank you, Phil, for your time. And uh, thank you for writing such an interesting book. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Rick. Keep up the good work. And um, it's been a joy to uh, interact with you. Thanks to those who've been listening or watching. Next week, I'll be speaking with a gentleman in Australia named Colin Blake. Drake. Blake? Drake. Colin Drake. And I've been listening, started listening to his book, and it's good stuff. He's very interesting. So it should be a good conversation. So see you then. Thanks a lot.
Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Phil.